computer giant IBM defends their empire viciously. Other computer companies had began to clone their computers to steal their clients and were now feeling the full might of their legal department. But one company was completely invulnerable. A company that somehow had made a perfectly compatible clone that was also portable. And this one company will start the path to IBM's destruction. This is that story. It is 1982. The Soviet Union General Secretary was about to die and the United Kingdom is fighting Argentina for control of the Falklands. And yet, according to Time Magazine, the most important thing to happen that year was the home computer. And IBM was on top of it all. After struggling to find a footing in the new universe for computers, a new division in Florida had finally struck gold by doing the most non-IBM thing they could do. Build a computer made by parts made by other companies and put it together in an open and documented design that made it easier to modify and design expansions for. And now that the IBM personal computer was quickly becoming the industry standard thanks to IBM's reputation, everyone was eager to see how they would follow it up. Don Estrich, who you might remember from the last video where he had become the accidental leader of this initiative, was ready to answer this question. The improvised and chaotic development process of the IBM PC might have gotten them positioned, but if they were going to diversify, they needed to go back to the one structure that properly scaled businesses. They needed to do things the IBM way. With the PC team now a formal division of IBM, Estrich wasted no time and created sub-branches to follow up with several successors to the PC for different price targets. And now that Estrich was vice president of the company, they were on top of the world. But what they didn't know is that something was about to happen that will put an end in their plans for complete industry domination. As IBM takes over the business world, electrical engineer Rod Canyon sits in his breakfast room and plays around with one of the first portable computers and dreams of making his own portable computer as a product. He used to work on electronic giant Texas Instrument, but him and a couple of friends were in the process of leaving to form their own computer company. But as Canyon explores ideas around portable computers, he can't shake a sense of dread. Computers at the time were like game consoles. Software had to be ported to each one, and since everyone could use an entirely different architecture, the process could be tremendously costly. There was no way a small company could convince developers to port software to their computers, no matter how good it was. And without software, they had no chance of success. But then, he was struck by a particular idea. What if they could build a portable computer that could run all software already written for the extremely successful IBM PC? The idea was not impossible. Since the IBM PC was made from components from other companies, they could secure the same processor from Intel, similar components for the rest of the peripherals, and the same operating system from Microsoft. Literally, the only thing they did not have was the BIOS, the most basic operating system integrated into the motherboard. But if they could somehow write a replacement for the BIOS, theoretically, they could enter the market with a huge amount of software already available. The idea itself had enough merit that after a series of successful pitches to a long list of investors, they incorporated under the name Gateway Technology Incorporated and got to work. Gary Stimak, another engineer from Texas Instrument, was tasked with creating a suitable replacement for the BIOS. Stimak, after buying an IBM PC, realized that the reference manual that you could buy with the computer included the entire BIOS ROM code printed at the end. Idiots. This is gonna be easy. You shouldn't have done that! W wait, what? You didn't think of consulting with me, the company lawyer, before doing this? This code is copyrighted by IBM, and you just contaminated yourself. Any BIOS code that you write will be derivative of this one, and IBM could sue us out of existence. Has that actually ever happened? It has never been proven in court yet. Do you want to be the first one? Oh, no, 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 what do we do? Do you have any programmers that you are certain have never looked at this manual? Hey, Steve, have you ever owned an IBM PC? A what? Good, so this is what we're going to do. You're going to use IBM's code to write a general reference of how it works, and then Steve here will turn your reference into a code that does exactly the same thing. As long as you carefully keep logs of the communication and you never write any bit of BIOS code and he never sees the original source code, 
we should be able to generate a legally safe clone. This technique, often called a clean room implementation, meant that with a bit of effort, they could have the hardest missing piece of the puzzle, a non-IBM BIOS that could perfectly replicate its functionality. Microsoft had not signed an exclusivity agreement with IBM for reasons explained in the previous video. However, the MS-DOS Microsoft facility did not include some last-second modifications IBM had done. Surprisingly, when Canyon spoke to Microsoft, they were more than happy to point gateway technologies in the right direction on how to modify MS-DOS for full compatibility, and were even open to sending that version back into the open marketplace. They were probably very aware that they were potentially creating tons of new clients for their operating system. It was at this point that Canyon and his team decided to change the name of their company to something a bit more catchy and reflective of their portable computer ambitions. Compaq, the Compact Computer Company. Now, let's clear something up. Compaq was not the first company that noticed there was an opportunity here. Less than a year after the release of the IBM PC, the first attempts at clones had popped up from companies like Columbia Data Products and Eagle Computer. In their rush to be the first, these companies had just used the stock MS-DOS and spent no time trying to implement the IBM-specific modifications, which meant they had some level of compatibility, but it was not perfect. However, one important question remained to people at Compaq. How had this company secured a viable BIOS alternative so fast? Columbia Data Products had famously also used the same clean room technique to create a legal copy of the BIOS, but not everyone was as careful. As Compaq executives prepared their booth at Comdex, the biggest computer show at the time, they strike up a conversation with people at other booths and find the answer. Oh, we just changed a few lines of the IBM code in the manual. Did, did he talk to a lawyer about that? <laughs> Do you know how much a lawyer costs? We wrote no copyright infringement intended at the top. It's probably fair use or something. It's fine. Well, they were about to test that assumption with fire. But the spark that will lit the gunpowder will not come from the company you expected. This is one of the Ace 1000 series from Franklin Computers, a clone computer. But not of the IBM variety, but of the old, but still tremendously popular, Apple II. The story here is similar. Engineers at Franklin had straight up copied the ROM, the closest thing the Apple II had to a BIOS, in order to create a device capable of running Apple II software. But a few months after its release, Apple computers sued Franklin, alleging that the ROM they had copied was their copyrighted property. And the United States Court of Appeals of the Third Circuit determined for the first time that copyright applied to BIOS code. And as you can imagine, lawyers at IBM were following this trial closely. As soon as the verdict was handed, IBM lawyers went on a rampage, suing every company they could find and had copied the BIOS code on their documentation. But lo and behold, they skipped over Compact. Their lawyer had been right. Compact owned one of the only compatible, legally safe BIOS clones. The floodgates were open. With someone proving you could legally reverse engineer the BIOS, their control of the ecosystem was lost. And if they had any hope of maintaining their position as market leader, they will have to drag the entire market kicking and screaming into a format they could lock down and control for good. The last battle for the soul of the PC was about to begin. And you could be watching that story right now. That's right, the conclusion to this exciting trilogy of how an entire industry got together to kick IBM out of the product they created is up right now in our streaming service, Nebula. This is a Nebula first show, meaning that by the time any episode hits YouTube, the next one is already out in Nebula always. And that is not all. Every episode has a bonus video from my Nebula exclusive series, SideQuest, this time exploring the story of one of the companies that dedicated itself entirely to cloning IBM BIOS at an industrial scale, and then selling it to all clone makers. And it is not just me. Extra History is always one episode ahead of Nebula, Wendover Productions has their fantastic Nebula original series about logistics where they recently put out an episode about the logistics of arms manufacturing, and Real Life Lore, which you might have noticed, Boises, one of the main characters in this trilogy, has his fantastic Modern Conflict series, which deep dives into what is happening right now in geopolitics. None of these could exist without Nebula. Nebula is the most interesting thing happening right now in independent video and you can get in for the fraction of the price of any other streaming service. 
if you use my link in the description, go.nebula.tv slash LoxBackGamer or the QR code on screen right now, you get a 40% off annual subscriptions, which comes down to about $2.5 a month. Not to mention, you will be supporting a growing community of creators. This channel already only exists due to the support of those of you watching in Nebula. So, thanks for watching.